God, we love you. We need you today. Lord, I pray that you'd help me now. Lord, uh, help me to focus and to uh, gather my thoughts here. Lord, I pray that you'd help us now as we look at this message, Lord, this word, Lord, your word. God, I pray that you would uh, help it to come alive to us. I pray that it would uh, help us to live for you. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, in 2 Kings chapter number 5, we have the story of Naaman. Naaman in Scripture, the Bible says in verse 1, Now Naaman, captain of the host of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master and honorable. Honorable, why? Because the Lord, by him, by him the Lord had given deliverance unto Syria. Naaman was a captain of the host of the king of Syria. The Bible uses the term captain, but nowadays maybe it could be likened even to our term that we use, uh, the word general. Uh, he was in charge. He was the go-to man when it came to military might. The Bible says that he was a great man. He was an honorable man. He was a mighty man in valor. By him, God had used him. And it's not often that God maybe would take somebody like this in his particular situation. But God used him to bring deliverance to a country, a place that really uh, was not after God. And many times were a thorn in the side of God's people, Syria. Right, And so uh, the Bible says that by him the Lord had given deliverance to Syria. Syria had had great victory because of this man, Naaman. All right? And uh, the, Bible, the Bible even says some things about him. The Bible says that uh, Naaman was a man who was greatly skilled on the battlefield. Some Jewish accounts even give Naaman credit for being the man who killed Ahab. And that's just through historical record. But his name means this. It means pleasantness. Pleasantness, And I think that we may not see that about him until the very, very end of the message here today. But Naaman served under uh, Ben-Hadad uh, II and uh, was greatly used to bring victory there. As great as a man that Naaman was, however, God allowed him to contract, uh, contract a leprosy. Leprosy is not only a picture of sin in Scripture, but it's also a picture of the judgment of God. And so we oftentimes use leprosy and the progression of leprosy to talk about how sin often affects the life of a Christian. And that's still a good picture and a good illustration. But as we look into Naaman's life, we see that this leprosy could very well have been a consequence or a result of God's judgment in his life. We have several other examples of that and like that in Scripture where people contracted leprosy and had to deal with it and live with it. We have the example of Miriam. Miriam was with Moses and, uh, and the Bible says that she began to rebel a little bit against Moses' leadership. Matter of fact, she got critical of the man of God there, Moses, and uh, kind of stuck her nose in some business where it didn't belong. And the Bible says he struck her with leprosy. And she had to deal with that. And that was kind of a, a picture of the consequence of her, uh, of her rebellion. King Uzziah contracted leprosy after trying to take the role of both the priest and king. And we know that when he was going to offer incense, uh, he was struck with leprosy. Once again, as a consequence. As a consequence. Some say that perhaps Naaman got leprosy because at that particular point where uh, the army was gathering captives and bringing people out of Israel. They happened to, to get a, a Jewish girl, an Israeli girl, who was a maiden that will be mentioned here in verse number 2. Maybe it was a consequence for that, but I believe really his leprosy was a result of his pride getting the best of him. And we'll see exactly uh, what it is about Naaman and his pride here uh, through the message here today. But can you see it? A mighty, powerful man like Naaman. All right? he, is, he is socially popular in his day. A popular man, no doubt, in Syria who had been used to bring great victory militarily to his people. Now being the pride of Syria would also become the social outcast soon. Oh, maybe, maybe leprosy hadn't hit home yet, right? I don't think the leprosy had hit him enough yet to humble him. But it was on his way, and it was going to start doing its job. You see, what leprosy does is it begins to kill nerve endings in the infected skin. And the skin would get infected there, and then appendages would begin to fall off or tear off because the victims could not feel 
that they were causing damage to those particular appendages. So they would use them as normal. They would hit them against something. But they would not know. Why? Because it brought a numbness to the victim. They would become numb. I find that sin also can cause us to become numb. Leprosy is the perfect picture of sin. I find that sin too can cause us as Christians uh, to become numb to the things of God. Hey, numb to the leading of the Holy Spirit of God. Numb to the pain that our sin is causing other people. That's how sin is. It's tricky. It's messy. It sneaks up on you. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter number 14 and verses number 18 and 19, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over to lasciviousness. In 1 Timothy chapter number 4 and verse number 2, the Bible says, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. And so we know the effects of sin and we know what sin does in the life of a Christian. Hey, listen, if you find yourself there today, if you find your life wrecked by sin having numbed your life to its effect to other people in your life, if, and we can easily find ourselves there, don't allow yourself to reach the point where you don't care anymore. Seek the one who's able to provide forgiveness for that sin. Don't carry it. Look at verse number 2 of 2 Kings chapter number 5. In verse number 2, the Bible says, And the Syrians had gone out by companies and brought away captives out of the land of Israel, a little maid, and she waited on Naaman's wife. And she said unto her mistress, Would God my Lord were with the prophet that is in Samaria. We'll come back to verse 3. But here we see uh, a little uh, Israeli maid is taken captive. And really what's provided here is a wonderful testimony in Scripture. It's a wonderful testimony because here's a young girl who was taken captive from her home country. But here she is in Syria now, serving Naaman's family, the captain, the, the, the general there. And she has every reason in the world to be bitter. She has every single reason in the world to be upset by her situation with what, what God has allowed to come into her life. She was perfectly fine in her home country with her family. And now taken out of that, she has every right to be bitter against the God who's supposed to be taking care of His people. But here she is. She finds herself in Syria. And what does she do? She's living out a testimony for God while captive in a strange country. Man, what a wonderful testimony of how Christians ought to conduct themselves as we pass through this strange country that we call earth. And boy, is it getting stranger and stranger here. It's feeling more and more like our home is not here, but rather with the Lord. That's why I'm leery of those who come to church and can't muster up enough praise in their heart to sing out for God. And can't muster up enough, enough Christian fellowship to go and shake the hands of those around them who may be hurting. They rarely have an encouraging word and have difficulty engaging in the service. If you struggle and you find yourself in this situation where the situations of life that have befallen you are burdening you down and you're not able to look up and see the good around you, you're not able to look up and be a testimony to those around you, Hey, listen, you've got to rely on God. Let me give you an encouraging verse if you find yourself in that situation. 1 John chapter number 4 and verse number 4. Year of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is He that is in you than he that is in the world. The God in us is greater than those around us. That little Israeli girl, she never heard that verse. She'd never heard that God is greater than her enemies, but she knew from the testimony of others that God could overcome her situation. And that's what we know. Isn't, God, isn't that God's testimony to us? That God is bigger than any situation that we face? That God is bigger than anybody who could oppose us? She knew that even in her time of burden, she could minister and be a help to those around her. 
Man, that's a good Christian testimony right there. Hey, listen, that tells me something. That tells me if that young lady there could minister during her time of trouble and, and point people to the one who could help them. I know she pointed them to the prophet Elisha. I understand all this. But if she could point people to God, and if she could help people in her time of trouble, boy, that's an encouragement. That tells me. Regardless of it. Amen. That's pretty neat to understand. That means the spiritual leaders that we look up to, and I have many, either close or near, that I look up to, and I see them as they serve the Lord and live their life for God. When I see that all of us have situations that come into our life and I still see them serving, it leads me to think of the inevitable, and that is this. At some point in their life, they served and they ministered through hurt in their life. At some point, they had financial difficulty, but they continued to serve, and nobody knew about it. And nobody knew about the difficulty that they were passing through because they were busy living out their testimony for God for others. Well, that's a great testimony. That's convicting. You know, so oftentimes when situations befall us, we, uh, we, we get like hermits until it passes over. We hunker down, we shut the doors, we turn the lights off, and we say, Lord, help it to pass. Lord, help it. Man, it takes, it, it takes some, some, Christian, some Christian grace, God's comfort, to reach out in times where you feel like, man, nobody's helping me. Why should I reach out to them? It takes a lot of grace to be able to do that. What a great testimony this young lady had here. Let's minister in our difficulty. Verse number three. And she said unto her mistress, Would God my Lord were with the prophet that is in Samaria, for he would recover him of his leprosy. Then one went in, in verse four, and told his Lord, saying, Thus and thus, said the maid that is of the land of Israel. And the king of Syria said, Go to, go, and I will send a letter unto the king of Israel. And he departed and took with him ten talents of silver, and 6,000 pieces of gold, and 10 changes of raiment. Look what happens here. Naaman begins to depart. Naaman wants to go and get healed. But do you know who wants him to get healed almost more than Naaman does? Hard to picture it. The king of Syria. Hey, this is my best guy right here. This guy's brought us great victory. We can't, we can't do without him. Listen, if there's a way to get this guy healed, nobody here in Syria has been able to heal him. Nobody here, no false prophet here has been able to do anything. Baal's not doing anything for us here. Hey, let's go, to, let's go to Israel. Let's send him there and see if the man of God can't do something for him. Let's see if their God will work. And he departs. He takes with him the things that he believes are necessary to get healing. We'll talk about this later toward the end of the, of the message here. But Naaman departs and he takes with him, the Bible says, ten talents. 6,000 shekels of gold and 10 changes of raiment. That man's going on vacation. 10 changes of, I can't remember the last time I packed 10 changes of clothes, but, but here's Naaman. Could you, see, could you see him unloading all of his suitcases when he gets to Elisha? Anyhow, but listen, uh, listen to what he brought with his talents and with his gold. I won't bore you with the details, but hey, that's about, in, in today's modern day, check this out, $3 million. $3 million. He brought with him, and the, the raiment, the, the, the change of clothes would have been in today's probably $5,000. All of it together, about $3 million, most of it obviously being uh, the gold. He's got something else with him. He's got his letter in his hand. Now, the letter, the letter he's got the letter of confidence that the letter is going to get there. There's either a messenger that's delivering the letter or Naaman's got it with him in hand. We know that that letter eventually gets to the king. But regardless, Naaman departs. He takes all these things with him. He's ready to pay a large amount of money for something that money can't buy. Do you see that? Naaman's bringing with him and he's preparing to try to acquire something that cannot be acquired with this world's good. He wants healing. The Bible says here in verse number 6, And he brought the letter to the king of Israel, saying, Now, when this letter is come unto thee, behold, I have therewith sent Naaman my servant to thee, that thou mayest recover him of his leprosy. And in verse number 7, 
And it came to pass when the king of Israel had read the letter that he rent his clothes and said, Am I God to kill and make alive that this man thus send me to recover a man of his leprosy? Wherefore, consider, I pray you, and see how he seeketh a quarrel against me. Hey, he got nervous real quick. King Joram, uh, he was nervous because he feels like the king of Syria is after him. He feels like the king of Syria is setting a trap for him. Why? Because this is their, this is their warrior. This is their general. And the king, of, uh, the king of Israel is thinking to himself, we don't have any power like that. We don't have any witches or warlocks or anything like that. And of course, being from the north, uh, listen, this is, not, this is not necessarily a good king that we're talking about here. He wasn't in tune with the things of God. Obviously, he'd be looking at false prophets even himself. But listen, he didn't know what to do. He thought, man, he's, this guy, the king of Syria, he's looking to start a war with us. He's looking to pick on our country. I, I say one wrong thing. If I tell him that we can't provide healing, he, he's going to want to send his army and, and cause war with us. He was nervous. He didn't know what to do. As a matter of fact, the only real calm person that prevails in all of this that we see in this entire story is two people. is a little maid from Israel, and it's Elisha. Picture that. The only two people that have any calmness in this situation at all whatsoever will turn out to be God's people. Isn't that awesome? God's people have a calmness within them that permeates every situation. Hey, listen, even when you're going through it, if you're a child of God, you know you've got that calm, that peace, that God is in control, that God is with you through it all. And he was fearful that Syria would want a war. In verse number 8, the Bible says that Elisha, he hears this dilemma. In verse number 8, And it was so that Elisha, the man of God, had heard that the king of Israel had rent his clothes. And he sent unto the king, saying, Wherefore hast thou rent thy clothes? Let him come now to me, and he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. Elisha's not worried. He's not afraid. He knows that God's able to do it. He's seen God do it before. He's been in training for the Lord. And Elisha's ready to see God work. Elisha's not lifted up in pride. He just simply knows from experience what God can and can't do. And the list of what God can't do is zero. And the list of what God can do is endless. And he's got an ultimate confidence in God. He stays calm. I can't imagine what Naaman's thinking of Jehoram, who's supposed to be a testimony for God. But instead is all nervous. Naaman's watching him tear his clothes off in humility, not wondering what he's doing. He's, and Naaman's wondering, what in the world's going on here? This guy's going all crazy, losing everything here, losing his mind. But yet in verse number 9, we see Naaman obeys. He heads to Elisha's place, and we pick it up here in verse number 9. So Naaman came with his horses and with his chariot and stood at the door of the house of Elisha. Listen, I could see, I could see Naaman pulling up with his horse with his chariot, with his little entourage, and Naaman pulls up to Elisha's house. I'm not sure what Elisha's house would have looked like in that day, but there he is. He pulls up maybe to the tent or to the house there and uh, begins to maybe unload his things, and he's excited about getting out his shekels, and he's excited about his talents, and his servants maybe are carrying his suitcases, and he's ready to unload. It's almost like he's checking into some kind of health care facility. He's expecting that he's going to be there for a certain amount of time, He's got the clothes for the journey. He's ready for some healing. He thinks it's going to take a while. And he sits there. And maybe there's a little knock at the door at the house of Elisha. And the ultimate smack in the face to, to Naaman comes to his life. Something that he, he totally disregards. Hey, just imagine this. Just imagine this. You're at the fast food restaurant. And they get your order wrong. And, and then... In Jesus' name, you're sitting there wanting to hold it in and hold it in before you drive. Hey, can I, can I? Here's what we do. Here's what we do. We know who the decision maker is. You don't want to speak to the cashier. Nope. Nope. You want to speak to the manager. Why? You want to speak to the person who can make the decision. You want to speak to the person who has the power to say yay or nay. And at the very least, they can say it to your face, and then you can, no, just kidding. At the very least, they can say it to you, and you can go on your way mad, or you can go on your way glad, but you don't want to just take the word of somebody who's not in the position to make that decision. 
And Naaman knew in his heart that he wanted to get to the decision maker. He wanted to get to the prophet, the man of God that he'd heard so much about. I've got to hear from him. Would you know that Elisha knew that Naaman would want to see him face to face? Elijah sat in his chair, rocking away, sent his servant, didn't give Naaman the time of day. The ultimate humbling experience for Naaman. You're not even going to come to the door? You're not going to acknowledge that I'm here? We'll see that this was a big deal to Naaman here. You're not even going to open up and come and greet me and say anything to me. I've traveled all this far. I've brought you all these gifts. I've got my clothes ready to go. I've got my ID ready to check into this facility. Bring on the healing. Where's Elisha? Not going to talk to Elisha. Hey, listen, Naaman brought his pride. He brought his pride as much as he thought. He didn't think he was bringing it, but he brought his pride. He brought his reputation. And we've got to be careful how we come to God. We've got to learn in this day and age to come to God broken with a tender heart. And that's how Naaman should have come to God. But he came to God with all of his pride. And God is about to show us exactly what Naaman needs. He needs a dose of humility. You see, that leprosy hadn't hit yet. That nose was still there. Them fingers was still there. It hadn't gotten to the point where he was on his knees yet, begging for God to do something for his life. Hey, listen, that's a, that's a dangerous position for all of us to be in. Hey, listen, we're right to the point where we think we can still handle it. We're right to the point where we think we can still do it on our own. Don't let it get to the point where God has to bring us to our knees. Hey, listen, reach out to God in humility. In humility with a humble heart. Verses 9 and 10, Elisha stood at the door and Elisha sent out a messenger. Naaman got a little cold shoulder. He got ignored. He needed to be ignored a bit. He needed somebody to show him that he wasn't as important as he thought he was, and God was about to teach him a great lesson in humility. He thought that Elisha would meet him. Maybe this is us at times. Are you still coming to God in your pride? Are you still coming to God with what you can offer? Are you coming to God broken? Are you coming to God empty? Are you coming to God needy? Here's what the Bible says about approaching God in Psalm 51, verse number 7. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. Thou wilt not despise, O God. God wants us broken. God wants us needy. Naaman was lacking that, and so God taught him a little something here. We'll see a little outline here uh, to maybe help us remember the different points here, but we'll look at a couple things here concerning Naaman. Uh, Number one here, we see the command. We see the command in verse number 10. And Elisha sent a messenger unto him saying, Go and wash in Jordan seven times, and thy flesh shall come again to thee, and thou shalt be clean. Hey, seven times. Why seven times? We've all heard it before. Hey, listen. God's perfection and God's perfect cleansing, God's perfect restoration, God's perfect healing was going to come to Naaman's life right now. And God told Naaman, Naaman, go down to Jordan and wash uh, through, the, through the messenger here. Elisha said, go and wash. And God will cleanse you. Your skin will be clean. You'll be ready to go. Hey, listen, that, that, that was the command. Oftentimes, we don't understand the command. Oftentimes, God's commands are clear, but we're the ones that complicate the commands that God gives. Hey, hey God's very clear spoken in His Word. But a lot of times, we doubt His command because we don't want to do it God's way. We'll see what Naaman wanted to do here. He wanted to do it his way. The Bible says in verse number 11, I want you to see the cover-up. So we have God's command and then we have a cover-up in verse number 11. But Naaman was wroth and went away. And he said, Behold, I thought, he will surely come out to me. See how that was a big deal to him? That was a big deal. In his mind, he was playing it the way it was going to go. And in his mind, there was going to be some big to-do meeting with with Elisha. And he was going to come out and put his palm on his face and strike him with the Lord's power. And he was going to be healed right there. Hey, he could just strike this place and and say the word and and I could be healed. He had his, his mind made up on how it was going to go. Behold, I thought he'll surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and strike his hand over the place and recover the leper. 
The Bible says that Naaman was wroth. He was mad because that's not the way he pictured it. Hey, listen now, hold on a second. That's not the way he pictured his healing happening. That's not the purpose in his mind that he had, but God had a different plan. It was a cover-up because he got mad and he turned to leave under the guise of, I'm too good for this. Don't you know who I am? I'm Naaman. I'm the general here. I'm the one who gives the orders. I'm the one who's in charge. You don't tell me to go wash. Just come out here and give me your power. That way I can be healed. Do it the way that I think is best. He covered up his feelings under the guise of being too good, all because God did not answer the way that he expected. He was disappointed in God, and that's what it came down to. He tried to cover for it by getting mad and walking away. Hey, listen, perhaps God's been dealing with you about some commands that you may not like or you may not understand. And there's a lot of them in Scripture. Maybe God's been dealing with you about faithfulness to his house. Maybe God's been dealing with you about being kind toward your spouse and toward your children. Maybe God's been dealing with you. Maybe our giving hasn't been right. Maybe God's been dealing with you with separation from friends that pull you away from the things of God. If you're not careful, here's what will happen. God gives a command. We hear it. He nourishes with His Word. We walk out of church and we walk out of our devotion and our lessons, whatever the case may be, with good direction. Clear commands from God. And if we're not careful, we'll get mad because we don't understand. It's too hard to follow. Our pride is hurt. We'll walk away before God is able to bring victory, healing, and growth. And that's where a lot of people are at today. They know God's command. And they're frustrated because God's not given anymore until that command is obeyed. Hello? Hey, listen. Why would we expect God to pile on the list of, of things that we can do in our Christian life to grow and to go to the next level with Him and to see Him work and to see Him bless if we're not obeying the very first thing we walked away from and ignored because we didn't like it? Maybe you came to church and you came with your own preconceived idea about how to be saved. And you heard in church, John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. But in your heart, you're... I think we lost that. I think we lost that. Okay. Oh, boy. That's going to be peril deducted, I think. We'll have a funeral for that right there. Ooh, sorry, Pastor. All right. <laughs> wow. Okay, sorry about that. We'll use this pulpit mic because I don't have a choice. Are you texting Pastor already? Oh, oh man. <laughs> it's watching. Oh, okay. All right. Fair enough. Fair enough. I don't know where I was at, but listen. <laughs> we often stop before God can work. Maybe you came seeking salvation, and when, when the light bulb came on because you heard the preaching of God's Word and God clarified it, hey, it's through my son, but you're, but you're like, but, but I brought my works with me. But I brought my shekels and my gold with me. I brought my raiment, my change of clothes with me. I thought it was a process. I'm ready to be good this year. I'll gain salvation. I'll earn it myself. But when you heard it was Jesus and Jesus alone, maybe it caused you to get angry. Maybe it caused you to get bitter. Maybe you clammed up and you didn't receive Christ. Now's the time. Now's the time. Maybe you heard this. Maybe, you heard the, maybe you've heard it like we put it sometimes. The next step of obedience after salvation is baptism. I see a lot of support for it in the Scripture. Maybe you heard that and you're like, oh, that's not for me. I don't, baptism, uh, yeah. I'm, I'm glad to go to Baptist church, but the whole baptism thing, uh, not so important. You know, and maybe, and maybe you're expecting to hear from God and you're waiting for the growth and everything and, and God already put the next step of growth on your plate, but you didn't take it. But maybe it's not just that. 
Maybe we want our marriages to flourish and to do well, and we want that love between our spouse and ourself, and we want to have a great relationship, and we want forgiveness to be the theme of our home, and we want a good attitude to be the theme of our home, and we want our children in line, and all of them to serve God. Hey, but maybe... Maybe God's been working uh, with, with us men concerning anger issues. Maybe he's working with us concerning being a spiritual leader at home. And he's already put a couple commands on your plate. But you know what we do? No, I don't need that. No, I'll do the next thing. Well, there is no next thing. God said, I gave it. I gave it. You didn't want it. And so Naaman, he was already given the command. It was just up to him to obey. He covered up his feelings by showing that he was mad. But we know that he was mad at the Lord. Next, number, uh, verse number 13, we've seen the command, we've seen the cover-up. Let's look at the convincing, the convincing. Verse number 13, and the servants came near and spake unto him and said, My father, if the prophet had bid thee to do some great thing, wouldst thou not have done it? How much rather then when he saith to thee, wash and be clean. That's pretty good. That, isn't that the kind of friends that we all need? Man, that's, that's good Christian friendship right there in a nutshell. Hey, listen, we need to look out for each other like that. Hey, I know, I know the command is difficult, Naaman. I know, it's, I know it's a hard pill to swallow right now. I know you're not in the mental, the mental status here to, to be able to accept that, and, and you're struggling with the command right now. Listen, we all did. We all did. We all struggle with this thing at the start. We're trying to get going. The mature Christians in the room are thinking, yeah, I remember the start. It was rocky. But then you get to know the Lord and live for the Lord, and God begins to work. You see Him blessed. But right there at the beginning, it could be a little bit shaky. We understand that. But listen, you'll, you'll be better off later on. You'd be better off later on. Just go ahead and obey the Lord. Do what the Lord asks. And they encouraged him. They convinced him. And something about maybe God's spirit, something about God worked in him. And Naaman's heart tenderized right there when he heard that. And you never know what an encouraging word to somebody else alongside will do. Hey, instead of, instead of, instead of pouting up and being a part of the pity party and, and adding to the negativity, hey, be a breath of fresh air. Be somebody who goes against the grain and says, hold on a second, what about this perspective? What about God's perspective? What about what God wants? And be a, an advocate for God. We see the convincing. Encourage others to live for Him. Encourage others to grow, to do, and attempt difficult things for God. And so we see the command, the cover-up, the convincing in verse number 14. Then he went down, and he dipped himself seven times in Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God. And his flesh came again like unto the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. Naaman did exactly what Elisha commanded, and he was clean. It didn't take ten changes of clothes. We'll see here in a second. It didn't take all the shekels. It didn't take all the talents. None of that mattered. What mattered was Naaman's heart if he was ready and tender to receive the command, and then if he would act upon the command that he was given, God was going to do a work. But you see, there's always a part of the command that lies on us. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not talking about works. I'm talking about an accepting of what God says. I'm talking about when the Word of God settles deep down in your heart, and you're like, this is what God is telling me. This is what's in it for me. Here is my part. And I'm amazed at that because we know that salvation is not of works, but we know that growing in grace, there is a part that lies on the Christian. I always use this example. It's terrible, but, but, but if you bear with me, as a Christian, my growth in grace, a lot of it does depend upon me obeying what God has said. In other words, God is a strong God, but He's not going to come down and remove the influences in my life that are pulling me away from God. He's given me to do that. He's given me to do that. God is not going to come down in fleshly form and audible voice and apologize to my wife if something is not right. It is me that has to do that. I have to vocalize. I have to be the one with a submitted heart to God. So in other words, yes, the Christian life is lived by faith, and we understand that, but there's a part that lies upon us to be submitted to what God has asked us to do. Naaman finally tenderized his heart here. God did, and and he submitted to what God said. He was perfectly cleaned, perfectly cleansed, perfectly restored. We see the cleansing, and then 
Lastly here, look at Naaman's class. Quite the class act here at the end. Now, he didn't act that way before, but here's the example we see. And he returned unto the man of God, he and all his company, and came and stood before him, and he said, Behold, now I know that there is no God in all the earth, but in Israel. Now, therefore, I pray thee, take a blessing of thy servant. I don't know that we'll get into those parts here. We're going to wrap up here in just one minute. But you see, Naaman's quite the class act there. Why? You remember the ten lepers? That Jesus in the New Testament, he healed all ten. And remember the nine walked away, and the one as he was walking away, he turned back, and he, thank you, thank Jesus. And Jesus said to him, the famous line, where are the nine? There weren't, there, weren't there ten that were cleansed, and only one's come back to be grateful? That's, that's pretty crazy. Hey, listen, I, I, this, let me insert in here. This isn't man worship, okay? If, if, if you're mistaking this for man worship, this isn't, this isn't worshiping a man. This is, this is a thankful heart for an investment, all right? And so Naaman, he goes back to Elisha, and he returned to the man of God, he and all his company. He returned back, and he even offered a few things. Now, we know that Elisha declined. Why? Because he didn't want Naaman to feel like the king had bought himself a miracle, and so he declined that. But Naaman was thankful. His heart was screaming it. And Lord, we need to be thankful. And maybe there are some things that God has done throughout last year, 2023, that we've not sat down yet and had a come to Jesus meeting and thank God for all of his provision, bringing us safe thus far. Maybe that was a year where God brought salvation for you. Maybe that was a year where God showed mercy to you and to your family. Maybe that was a year where you saw the love of God. Maybe that was a year where his patience was great in your life. We should always turn back. We should always turn back to the Lord. Thank you, Lord. Not so much to a man, although I put a quick note in here. Recognize the investments of those who have uh, made investments in our life. This morning I was with my family. We were running a little bit late. We never run late. I don't know why. Uh, we were running a little bit late and, uh, in, our, in our minivan, and we went to go pick up a couple of uh, bus children that moved to Franklin. And we're doing everything in our power to try to get them picked up. It's not always workout timing, but it worked out. And uh, we made it work. And as they were getting in the van and the van door opened up, uh, technology's gotten better. Uh, the van's a different color. Uh, the location has changed a little bit, uh, maybe uh, 20 minutes from where I was originally picked up in a van to come to church. And that, and that got to me this morning. And I started getting a heart of thankfulness when those kids got in our van and I won't tell you how many were in our van. When those kids got in our van, uh, we might have been a seat shy. But uh, I had a little flashback, and I said, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I know pastor's not here this morning to thank him, but he was driving that van with his wife. And just as, you know, we think of the inconveniences, uh, oh, man, I could have been earlier. But as that van door's opening, I thought, yeah, it's a little bit of an inconvenience, but, man, it's so worth it. And I, I have a feeling that maybe they were really inconvenienced by me when I got in. And, and uh, I didn't say much. I didn't talk much. Uh, just as awkward as I am today. But they, uh, they, uh, they suffered through it. And they uh, had a good testimony with me. But uh, what a beautiful picture of what God does for us at salvation. Naaman brought what he thought would help. But the Bible says clearly in Ephesians 2, 8, 9, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Maybe this morning you have your thought on what it is that will save you. God has his word on what it is that will save you. And that's the shed blood of Jesus Christ. He didn't understand it all. But in John 14, 6, the Bible says, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Perhaps you're here today and you're in need of God's forgiveness. He offers salvation through the shed blood of Jesus. If you came this morning and... We can share with you the greatest news of salvation. Just come up during the altar call here, and we'll pray with you and show you that. If there is a decision that needs to be made and God has worked, the altar is open. Let's stand together. The piano will play here in just a moment. We'll pray, and then we'll open up the altar for the invitation. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you for your word. Thank you for this example of Naaman. Lord, help us to have a tender heart toward your commands. Lord, help us as your people to be a testimony, Lord, to those around us. Thank you, Lord, for your people here today. I pray that you'd work even through our invitation. 
And Lord, we pray that you bless our day. We ask it in Jesus' name. As the piano plays, you can come if you need to.